Lord, may we ever seek that one needful thing and do the better part. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, imagine the scene with me, if you would. Jesus and his band are traveling throughout the land. Uh, they come to this particular village, and a woman called Martha, notice it's Martha, this is important in terms of what happens later, she's the one extending the invitation. She says, please come in and have lodging and, and food here in our home. Well, I'm not quite sure she entirely knew what she was getting into. Um, because you see, the, the problem with Jesus is that he never travels alone. He's always got company with him. And they're not always the kind of people that you would normally uh, think of as your dinner partners. Think, for instance, of lepers. Think of tax collectors, who are not like IRS bureaucrats, but more like Tony Soprano, you know, thugs <laughs> who extort people. Think about um, former prostitutes and people who have had all kinds of maladies and, and demon possessions. And all of them, of course, homeless, hungry, and they have now descended on Martha's house, along with Jesus. So she has to prepare a rather large meal here, right? Um, and you can understand why that might get her a little distracted, even a little anxious. And so she has a very human little outburst, which is basically, hell! Right? She's saying, um, uh, Mary, could you stop listening to Jesus for a while and get in the kitchen with me, because I can really use another hand. Um, then, of course, Jesus issues the famous response that we've heard in the Gospel this morning. Now, notice that Jesus never says, Martha, get out of the kitchen. Martha, don't be hospitable. Martha, don't do humble service on behalf of others. That would be completely uh, contradictory to everything else Jesus said and did. We know that he was devoted to the whole idea of hospitality, devoted to the whole idea of humble service, to the point where he did the most menial of all tasks, which was to wa wash feet. And so he surely cannot be condemning Martha's choice to provide a meal for Jesus and all his motley crew. I can never read or hear this story without thinking of my great-grandmother, Alice Pearson Bayless, from Warrensburg, Missouri, who went and settled in Oklahoma during the, during the land rushes. She was a very devout woman, I hear. I didn't meet her. She died four, about four or five years before I was born. I do have a double wedding ring quilt that she pieced, which is a very precious family heirloom. And so over the years, I began to hear more and more stories about Great Grandma Alice. And I remember the day that I was shocked to learn that this very devout Christian woman never went to church. And so that really got me curious, and I wanted to hear the whole story. And what, what I found out was that her husband, my great Grandfather Henry was the lay pastor of the church that was very near their home. Uh, he often brought in uh, other pastors from other churches. He would bring in uh, traveling evangelists. There was always a reason to show hospitality. And so Great Grandma Alice stayed home during church, and she prepared a very delicious meal so that as soon as church was over, everybody had a warm, freshly prepared delightful meal that they could enjoy after church. I, I, I kind of think I know a little what that food was like because the recipes were passed down to the family. We still use some of them, especially at Thanksgiving time, and she must have been one fine cook. I never heard that she complained or criticized others for not helping her or, or demanded that people feel the same sense of call and sacrifice that she did. She just did what she felt was her particular gift on behalf of the community, and because of that gift that she shared so generously, so sacrificially, it really built the bonds of community in that, in that congregation. What we call koinonia was established as people learned to share freely with one another as sisters and brothers in Christ. And I'm pretty sure that Jesus would in no way criticize my great-grandmother Alice because of the choice of service that she made. And I think at that time, no one would have questioned Martha's sense of duty. Everyone agreed that women belonged in the kitchen. It's Mary's part that people didn't agree on. 
Mary is, feels called to sit at the feet of Jesus and to learn from the rabbi, to take in all of his teaching, be part of the discussion. And that was rather controversial at the time. Women were not supposed to do that. She wasn't supposed to be there. That was the men's job. And Jesus, in his response to Martha, defends Mary's choice and her sense of calling. And then and now, that was an act of radical inclusion on Jesus' part. To say that being a disciple is not just for men, it is for men and women equally, and in fact we know it is for all kinds of people. And so this, this act of Jesus, this defense of Mary that we hear today, challenges us to continue to be as fully inclusive as we can, to live out the idea that all people are called to listen to Jesus, to be his disciples. Now I hope you all agree that um, there is much that causes distraction and worry in our lives. Um, just this week on Tuesday, on one of our very hot days, my air conditioning went out. And that's rather anxiety producing, not just because the house is going to be warm, but because I have to worry about what is the bill going to be on this one. Right? <laughs> you know, I need a whole new unit or whatever. And you know, I've listened to the teachings of Jesus all my life. He tells us not to worry about the next day. We should just worry about today. We don't have to worry about clothing. We don't have to worry about food, God will provide, I know this, and yet every time the temptation of anxiety gets me again, right? And uh, it turned out it was just a little electrical problem, it wasn't even a hundred dollar repair job, you know, but, but I, I was caught again <laughs> doing what Jesus tells us not to do, which is to be distracted and worry. Now, I, I don't know about you, but lately when I watch the news or read the newspaper, it's pretty worrisome, pretty anxiety producing. Um, so there's certainly things that, that, that are tempting us to move, to, 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 to move away from our center in Jesus. And that's why so often he would say, you know, don't fear, trust, believe. But you know, it's easier said than done, isn't it? Quite frankly, how do we trust God? How do we remain calm? You think of all those signs in Britain, you know, care, remain calm and carry on and so on, you know. Uh, how do we stay centered as we go about the work of welcoming our Lord and all the people that come along with him. Jesus tells Mar Mary and Martha there is need of only one thing if we want to not be anxious and distracted. What is that one thing? Well, I think the context makes it crystal clear. You might remember that this whole part of Luke began with a lawyer coming to the Lord and saying, what must I do to be righteous? And Jesus uh, shared what we call the double love command. And first we had the part about loving my neighbors ourselves, which we saw uh, developed by Jesus in the great parable of the Good Samaritan, or the story of the great Good Samaritan. So now, today, is the other part. The one thing that we need, that we're called to do, is to love God with our whole being, with our heart, with our soul, with our strength, and with our mind. That is what Mary is doing as she listens closely, attentively to her Lord Jesus. That's the better part for all of us. Whether we're in the kitchen, whether we're in church, whether we're at the food pantry, whether we're on the street talking with our neighbors, whatever our call is, we are called to love God with our whole being, all of us, all of me, as the song says. First John tells us that it's perfect love that drives out all fear. And perfect love, of course, can only come from God. God alone is perfect. And we, John also tells us we love because God first loved us. And so if we're going to have that total love of God that Jesus calls for, we first need to hear how very precious each and every one of us are to God. As I was writing the sermon, I looked over and I keep a card that's on my desk that has my favorite quote from the great Western theologian Augustine of Hippo. I love this quote. Augustine said, God loves each of us 
as if there were only one of us. In other words, each of us are God's favorite child. That's the kind of God, love that God has for us. It, that saying means a lot to me because that card was given to me at a youth happening in, in Pittsburgh, Kansas by my friend Ellie. And my friend Ellie has had a lot of struggles in her young life with physical ailments of all sorts which have affected her ability to pursue her profession and therefore have often left her income rather uncertain. And yet she knows that God loves her and she wants to love God in return and love God's people in God's name. And so it's very meaningful to me that I have that saying of Augustine given to me by my friend El. Perfect love drives out all fear. I learned this about oh, a decade or more ago when um, my wife had a routine examination and they found out that there were polyps in her colon that concerned them, might be cancerous. So they scheduled a, what, a colon resection surgery to take out a piece of the colon so they can put those uh, polyps under a microscope, do a biopsy, and find out if there's cancer or not. The idea of my wife having cancer just terrified me. I was, I was shaking blob of fear, you might say. Uh, and the night before the surgery, I couldn't sleep at all. I was so worried about this. Thank God, many of our friends around the world were holding us up in prayer, and I think it made a tremendous difference. I remember like 2 o'clock in the morning, it was as if the Spirit came to me and reminded me of those words that we find in Romans 14. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to God. God has laid God's claim on us. God has marked us as God's own. And therefore, no matter what happens in God's embrace, things will work out. And that gave me such a great sense of God's love for me and for my wife and for my daughter that I was able then to fall asleep and, and be peaceful the rest of that night. It turned out that her pulse were benign and everything worked, but I had in that moment realized no matter what happens, good or bad, God loves us and God will take care of us. Perfect love drove out fear. And once we have experienced that perfect love of God, we yearn to love God in return with all that we can offer to our loving God. I love the saying of Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be added to us. And in doing so, in putting God's reign, God's purposes, the love of God always first in our lives, we discover again and again that there's nothing to fear. Not long ago I was going over my scrapbooks and I was in the high school section. Uh, let's just say that was a long time ago. And, no need to mention exactly how many years. <laughs> and I, I, I got to the page where there was a report card that really stood out to me and it brought back the memories of my fall semester as a sophomore when I had committed myself to being part of the leadership team at a youth retreat in a church. And then I found out that my band teacher had scheduled a band competition for that same weekend. And he was a he was the most head of band teacher I ever knew. I think he would have run over other band teachers, you know, for, for us to get the good marks. And so he was pretty upset that I, when I told him that I was not going to be there, I had to go to church instead. He yelled at me. He told me I would have to accept the consequences of my poor choice, etc., etc. I stuck to my guns. I went to the church camp instead. And I guess he calmed down or rethought or something because at the end of the semester, my grade was not affected. So I, when I, I circled that grade on my grade card and I wrote above there, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. <laughs> now, pretty trivial example, right? I mean, when you think about the tremendous sacrifices made by people like Martin Luther King Jr. or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But for me, a very important lesson in let us love God first with all our whole being. Let us place the kingdom first. And when we do so, all shall be well because that is God's call and God's purpose with us. So my friends, today we are called to be like Martha. We are called to welcome Jesus and all the people that come with Jesus. We are called to provide for their physical and material needs as best we can. To exercise always hospitality. And we're also called to be like Mary at the same time. To be at Jesus' feet, to listen, 
carefully to our Lord, to be his students always, to let ourselves be gradually transformed into his likeness. And to remember always that in all we do, we are so cherished, we are loved so deeply. And therefore, in response, let us love God with our whole being, with everything that we have, everything that we are. And as we do so, I hope we will always hear the words of Julian of Norwich. You know, she was a, a, a person, what we call a recluse or a hermit, that she lived in the side of the cathedral. She just had a little slit through which she could receive food and look out at the world around her. She devoted her whole life to prayer for others and, and, and to being in God's presence. And this was the time of the Black Plague, of the bubonic plague. It was, you know, there was death all over. And yet what came to her in the revelation that she received was the tremendous awareness of God's great love for us and for all people. And if, even in the midst of that dark hour, that allowed her to say, because God loves us so deeply, all is well and all shall be well. For God is love. And when we love, we are God. So friends, let us live the life of love. Let us spread the love in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.